Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, you know, it's a rather lovely Florida Monday. We've got weather with temperature in the 50s. It feels quite nice. We're supposed to have a high in the upper 70s. No complaints at all. I mean, this is, you know, it's not cold enough for me. I do like cold weather, but uh, this is proper Florida season weather, uh, which is one of the reasons people come here in the season, uh, because it is quite nice. It's not freezing. It's not hot. It's just absolutely perfect. Uh, if it was like this year round, all our homes would be worth a billion dollars and we'd be set. But uh, unfortunately, the summer does bring some miserable weather, which I've gotten into so many times before I probably shouldn't again so I won't uh, in fact uh, I'm gonna try and make this a more uh, I don't know efficient video if you will I you know they do tend to ramble on they've gotten longer and longer over the years so uh, I'm gonna leap right into this car and uh, get rolling uh, what we have today is a 1974 Cadillac Coupe DeVille uh, it's finished in what what do they call this ferro gold or something to that effect let me look this up for a minute Ah, the hell with it. Doesn't matter. It's gold. Uh, we can say that much. I'm dropping my phone here, which is why the camera's starting to flit around. But um, anyway, it's inside and out. It's that, uh, I believe, the ferro gold color, and it's a rather attractive piece. I'm very happy with this car, I have to say. Uh, I did that uh, Lincoln, no, not Lincoln, what was it, the Mercury Cougar last week, and uh, it was an incredibly well-preserved example. And while this one isn't quite there, uh, it's so damn close that it's uh, really indistinguishable in terms of condition. And uh, with uh, one glaring exception, it is one of the finest used cars that I've seen in a very long time. Never mind collectible cars. I mean, this is something that would have just appeared on like the Cadillac certified pre-owned lot in 1976. Uh, it's just that nice. Uh, this is the fourth generation Coupe de Ville. Uh, yeah, the, the first real Coupe de Ville, not, yeah, there, well, okay, there, there's, Everything's always complicated. The first Coupe de Ville came out in 1949, and it was a show car, and it was made for the 1949 Motorama. And it was a very expensive car based on the Cadillac 60 Special, uh, which was its most expensive platform at the time, Caddy's most expensive platform. Uh, it was one of the first, if not the first, hard top uh, pillarless coupes. That that means it would sort of have windows that went down in the front of back, front and back, leaving just a hard top, and uh, that was something that stuck with the car for many many years to come. It proved very popular. Uh, anyway, it was a very fancy, very special car. So special, in fact, that uh, uh, Charlie, what was his name? Charlie Wilson, the uh, GM uh, head at the time, uh, took it as his personal car and drove it for quite a few years until uh, giving it to his secretary for <coughs> services rendered in 1957. That's it. I wonder what his wife thought about that. Uh, but anyway, the secretary ended up with it. Uh, she had it for a few years. Down the road, many years later, the car got tracked down and, you know, rough shape, was restored and is now in a private collection somewhere in Canada, of all places. Uh, but anyway, that was the first car that was badged uh, as a trim package uh, as the Coupe de Ville, and uh, it was very, very expensive. Uh, it became a trim package on the uh, Cadillac Series 62 for a few years uh, until becoming its own model in 1959, and you really just can't get any more famous than that. You remember that car with the giant tail fins and the four little bulleted lights and the bulleted front bumper, uh, one of the most iconic cars of the 20th century century was the 59 Coupe de Ville. Uh, Cadillac is a fascinating car company. Uh, we've gone through its history before, but a real brief overview. Uh, started in the early, early uh, 20th century, I want to say like 1903, uh, with an eye towards precision engineering. It came to be because it was uh, built from the ashes of the uh, Henry Ford Motor Corporate. Henry Ford got in a fight with his investors. Uh, he took off. They called in a guy named Henry Leland to uh, liquidate the company, and instead of liquidating at Henry, Leland decided to keep it going, uh, you know, using his own engine and some other bits and pieces. And uh, it became actually quite successful. Even though the first Cadillac was more or less a Model A, uh, it had more precision engineering. That was their focus at the time. In fact, it paved the way uh, for much more modern 
uh, assembly line practices where parts were interchangeable. And it actually got a Doer's Award, which is a, a European British award in 1908 or 7. I don't remember which. But anyway, it was a big deal at the time uh, because they were able to demonstrate its parts interchangeability. Uh, it also got it a couple of years later for having the first electric starter and the first uh, wiring harness that gave it electric light. So uh, Cadillac has always sort of been at the forefront of American car engineering. And it was, you know, taken over by GM early on. Uh, William Durant got in a fight with Henry Leland over the bombing of the, yeah, the, Leland was a pacifist or man, we were there. Durant was a pacifist. He didn't want to build bombs or bombers and Leland did. And uh, so anyway, Leland took off and he founded a company called Lincoln, which started building bombers and uh, the rest is history until Ford took over Lincoln and kicked the shit out of Leland for fucking him over on the original Cadillac deal. Uh, Ford was, of course, quite a famous bastard. Uh, but anyway, long story short, Cadillac was founded. It was named after a, a famous French scofflaw named uh, Antoine, Ant Antoine, geez Louise, Antoine uh, de la Moth Sir Le Cadillac or some shit like that. Uh, he was uh, sort of a French con man who invented a whole nobility heritage and, you know, conned some noble woman into marrying him and ended up founding Detroit and New Orleans and, you know, had a pretty big deal in, in early America, but, uh, you know, really didn't deserve it. Even the coat of arms, which is used as the Cadillac symbol, uh, was sort of improvised and created by this guy. Uh, it didn't really exist other than in his imagination and gave him a sort of fake uh, noble root. So uh, you could say that Cadillac was founded on a charlatan. Uh, but even so, it became quite an important car company. <clears throat> and for many years, decades, even through the building of this car, uh, was synonymous with American luxury, American engineering, and became a trademark almost like Coke, Jeep, or Kleenex. You know, something that could almost be used uh, generically for a product. You know, this is the Cadillac of of recliners. This is the Cadillac of television sets. Uh, it just became synonymous with the best of the best. And uh, Cadillac very much held on to that and, uh, you know, exploited it over the years until uh, everything went south from eh, probably this car onwards. But we'll get into all that. So in 19... Uh, 71. This was the C platform, uh, a big sucker, big platform. It was about as big as it got in General Motors, 130 inch wheelbase, uh, exactly the same as that 59 uh, Cadillac Coupe de Ville that had the tail fin. So it was big. Uh, it was also very wide. Uh, inside the shoulder room was record setting. Uh, there really was nothing else to compare to it until, uh, believe it or not, the mid 90s when those uh, GM aero cars came out, like the Caprice Classic, the Roadmaster, and uh, the new Cadillac Brome, they had roughly the same shoulder room as this car, but uh, at the time, this set records. It was as wide as it got. So uh, even in the midst of the early 70s gas crunch, if you remember... Uh, uh, the uh, OPEC, the oil producing countries, they got pissed off when America started supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. So they tightened the spigot on oil uh, and led to gas crunches, gas lines, uh, high price of gas. And it didn't really matter to Cadillac. They just kept going. I mean, they did a little bit, you know, the emission stuff, the uh, toning down of uh, compression ratios, that sort of thing. Uh, but otherwise, they just pretended they were going to be unaffected and they kept going. Going. And you really have to hand it to Cadillac for that. They still kept building these monsters uh, while everyone around them was kind of freaking out a little bit. Uh, so anyway, in this fourth generation Eldorado, it was a new, <clears throat> all new, you know, blank paper beginning. Uh, this 74 model had the only year with four round headlights close together. The 71 models had... Uh, uh, round headlights with parking lamps in the middle that continued through 73 and then in 75 it became four square lamps so uh, the 74s are pretty easily distinguishable based on that uh, also in 73 they got these big impact energy absorbing bumpers uh, which uh, you know prolonged the front and rear bumpers on the car made the car even longer than before and what they essentially did was they were mounted on big struts uh, kind of a design that continued 
previews today of sorts, and they would absorb impact, uh, whether it was from, you know, really shitty parallel parking uh, or just a uh, very slow five mile an hour collision on the street. And uh, those uh, big uh, impact strips in the front did absorb quite a bit and saved a lot of bumper dings for people. So uh, not too bad, not too shabby. Uh, you also have this big wind splint in the middle. You have this beautifully creased hood. Uh, and these um, uh, the hood ornament became an option this year uh, with different packages. So not on this one. Instead, it has at the leading edge of the hood this uh, uh, your wreaths and crests, or at least just your crests with the Cadillac V. Uh, also, the uh, V... Uh, egg crate grill, the little uh, license plate surrounds, and then the wider impact uh, bumperettes on either side. Uh, quite a handsome car, and frankly, a little bit near and dear to my heart. Uh, my dad had a 74 Sedan DeVille, uh, which he kept way too long, and when I was a kid, I was embarrassed by it. I mean, everyone's driving celebrity Eurosports at the time and looking hip and cool, and uh, up comes my dad in this ridiculous old dinosaur. I wish I knew now, uh, then, now now how cool that car was then and I would have appreciated it a lot more than I did so eh, you know the wisdom of adulthood uh it, uh, it changes. Uh, anyway, the parking lamps were moved to the side. They wrapped around. The bumper wrapped around, went all the way to the wheel well. You got chrome uh, trim on the wheel well. You've got more chrome trim on the bottom of the car going to the rear wheel wells, which do have those removable fender skirts. And uh, frankly, very handsome. Uh, another big issue in 74, I wouldn't call it an issue maybe, uh, was that they finally did away with the hardtop coupe. The 73 had movable rear windows. So uh, you would get, they even called it a hardtop convertible at some point, uh, where the rear window would go down. Uh, in 74, that changed. Uh, it became a fixed opera window at the back. And uh, that was kind of significant because truly the first Coupe de Ville, uh, one of its most distinguishing features, other than the fake air scoops and one-piece glass and that kind of stuff, was the uh, hardtop pillarless coupe thing uh, that opened up the whole side of the car. Uh, there you see those extended uh, bumperettes, or and yeah, bumpers, not really bumperettes, in the back with the impact strip, the gray with the white trim, uh, the taillights underneath the trunk lid, uh, the Cadillac script, the uh, interesting little bulges in the lights here uh, to uh, be visible from the rear. All very handsome, and uh, you know, again, Cadillac said be damned. Also, the gas door underneath the license plate, which is very cool and interesting. Uh, I believe the uh, van, uh, the vinyl padded top was uh, quite standard at the time, came on all the Coupe de Ville's. And again, there's something about the condition of this car which just blows my mind. I mean, you just can't duplicate this stuff. You would have to spend $80,000 to bring this car back to this condition uh, if you wanted to, which the car isn't worth that, so nobody would. Uh, it's just fascinating to find one that the, it's just this well preserved. I love the hidden wipers. That was a nice feature of this era. Uh, also, this razor thin A pillar. I mean, you want to talk about uh, visibility. I mean, what a terrific. It's almost like the canopy of a fighter plane up front. Uh, that uh, A-pillar is so thin and uh, absolutely almost invisible. Pretty damn cool stuff. Uh, big, uh, what is that, front disc brakes. It had coil springs up front with uh, double uh, wishbone type suspension. In the back it had trailing arms and a live uh, rear axle, which, um, you know, did it handle well? No. The thing weighed 5,000 pounds and was, you know, sprung like a lazy boy, so it handled like shit. But god damn did it provide a nice ride. Alright, anyway, let's just get into this thing. Uh, these cars sold incredibly well. They defied the odds, and in fact, it's part of what made Cadillac lazy, because the cars were just... 73 set a sales record, over 200,000 cars. 74 wasn't that much worse. And you have to remember that this was in the middle of the oil crisis. I mean, uh, Lincoln was losing a ton of market share. So was uh, Chrysler with their Imperial, and, uh, you know, all those cars were really depleting. Cadillac had barely felt it. And part of that was that it was coasting on its name. I mean, Cadillac was synonymous with success. And because this car was, 
I, I, I shudder to call it decontented, but it became less expensive than the Cadillacs of the past. And using new by, you know, bank financing methods, you know, bankers smiling as you trade in your old car, uh, you could have a house style payment, but even a middle class guy could drive a coupe de ville. And that uh, was what gave Cadillac such tremendous success. At the same time, it's what started to deteriorate the brand and why Mercedes-Benz started to climb uh, in the 70s because Cadillac became a lot less exclusive when it was synonymous with wealth and taste and, you know, it was great that a guy could pull up to his golf course driving a Cadillac and everyone thought he was rich, but when the caddy's also driving a Cadillac, <laughs> it becomes a problem. And uh, those guys, when they were troubled by that, started switching to Mercedes-Benz, which uh, even though it was a small car it was much more expensive uh, you know this thing was what 10 grand in 1974 uh, the cheapest comparable Mercedes was 20 grand basically uh, twice the money uh, no that's not true there was one there for probably 12 or 13 the e-class version at the time uh, but going up to the 450 SLC which was like a hundred grand in today's dollars uh, while this thing was 50 grand in today's dollars big big difference and uh, much more exclusive and that drew the very wealthy people over to Mercedes. Uh, so even if Cadillac benefited from having more middle class guys buy its cars, uh, that uh, eventually took a toll on them. Love the two key system and again back to the time machine thing, look at this thing with the uh, original Cadillac keys. Uh, I absolutely love it. I love finding cars in this condition. Uh, there you see the original rubber Cadillac floor mats. Carpeted mats were an option. Uh, this one still has them and you see the shape they're in. Uh, also the original Cadillac uh, trunk mat. Uh, the Space Saver rear tire which was standard on the car. Uh, all those uh, cardboard inserts finishing off the trunk look amazing. Uh, you've got the uh, jack and spare tire stowage, the jacking instructions. I mean, honestly, uh, I just cannot explain to you how breathtaking it is to drive uh, this car when it's so incredibly well preserved. It came from an estate in West Virginia. Uh, an old guy bought it new, had it for, uh, you know, almost to current. I think it went through one other owner for a couple of years in a collection. Uh, and it is just one of the most well preserved original cars that I've seen in a very, very long time, and I'm very happy to have it. I really would love to hang on to this thing if I could be a good steward to it. Uh, there's my bag of crap and my tire inflator, but uh, anyway, uh, everything nice and proper under the trunk. Let's have a look under the hood. This is going to be heavy. <laughs> All right, let me pause this and get. All right, that was way better to do uh, two handed, not even worth trying with one. Just absolutely insane. This is a big, heavy hood on this car. Anyway, what we have under here is a uh, 472 cubic inch V8 engine. Uh, it came out in 68. Uh, it could have been put at 500, but they kept it at 472. And when it came out in 68 and 69, 70, it had 375 horsepower and like 500 plus uh, pound feet of torque. Uh, in 74, the rating was 210 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque. Now, it didn't drop that much because of emissions and compression ratios and that sort of thing. Uh, what actually changed was the SAE standard. Uh, that's the uh, Society of uh, Automotive Engineers. Uh, for horsepower ratings. Horsepower had been the sort of arbitrary standard. This is going to be convoluted, but I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, horsepower historically in American cars had been rated in optimum conditions with the engine on a stand, not even with the transmission, no pulleys, no alternator, no AC compressor, no water pump, a high output uh, sparking system uh, to create a higher 
horsepower rate in under optimum utopian circumstances that just don't occur in a car. This is the difference between gross horsepower and net horsepower. And that became a thing for advertising uh, through the 50s and 60s because the companies wanted to advertise big horsepower ratings uh, to draw in customers. In the 60s, uh, that continued for a while and then changed. They were still using that uh, gross number. That's why, you know, a 396 Camaro could have 450 horsepower, whatever it was showing, even though it really didn't at the rear wheels. Uh, this is where it gets convoluted. Uh, because safety and insurance started becoming a thing, they then started underrating these big horsepower numbers. So a 427 had the same rating as a 396, even though it obviously didn't. Uh, but that helped uh, with drag racing classifications and with... Um, uh, safety and insurance stuff. So anyway, all very convoluted. In 1972, California started insisting that the cars sold there uh, be listed with their net horsepower. Now that's when the thing's on a stand going through proper exhaust with converters or whatever emissions it had at the time and the engine accessories and uh, the normal the distributor system that it would have in production. And that radically lowered the amount of horsepower that a car could be advertised with. Uh, on top of that, of course, was all of the emission standards that came uh, with the gas crunch and, you know, whatnot and the lowered compression. So uh, it truly wasn't this giant drop from 375 horsepower down to 210. Uh, there was a drop for sure, but it was not quite as radical. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say instead of 375, the, uh, you know, 472 in its original incarnation, if measured by the same way this engine was probably had somewhere in the high twos. So uh, maybe they lost 20% uh, of the horsepower, but not nearly what it appeared to be. You know, you can imagine the poor Cadillac salesman. A guy goes in to trade in a 68, and uh, the sales guy at Cadillac tells him, no, yeah, well, you're going from 375 to 210. I feel bad for that guy, but uh, otherwise the, the motor wasn't quite as detuned as, uh, as it would appear based on its advertised ratings. Uh, the preservation of this original motor is fascinating to me. You can see the original blue uh, paint on the alternator bracket, the valve covers everywhere, all very well preserved. The nice little sheen on the uh, fender liners, the air conditioning system. Really, really impressive car, I have to say. The original hood liner on the car, it just is tremendous to look at. And I kept this in here. Look at these strings. This must have been from the 70s. The guy who owned this fabricated a little mosquito netting thing to cover his radiator and uh, drop it down there. And I decided to hell with it. We're going to leave that in. That's a nice little bit of engineering the guy did. And I see no reason to remove it. So uh, I think that's pretty cool stuff. Uh, here's a little tidbit from a Swamp states like Florida and Louisiana. Uh, this 472 Cadillac is widely used in airboat applications. I mean widely and the 500 cubic inch. Uh, Cadillac rules the airboat world or at least it did for many many years. Uh, you know part of the reason for that was Cadillac's bulletproof reputation but a more engineering and mechanical reason for that was this engine produced a lot of its torque uh, in the uh, 3000 and below range where a big block Chevy Chevy produced a lot of its torque in the 4,500 and below range. Well, uh, you can't spin a, uh, an airplane propeller at 4,500. It's, it's too much. It's, uh, it's just going to be crazy. Uh, at 3,000, it spins nice. So uh, with the Cadillac engines, airboats get to use their max torque uh, right around the uh, revolutions per minute that an airplane engine requires, or sorry, airplane propeller requires at the, uh, at the proper uh, RPM. So uh, that's part of why you see a lot of 472 Cadillacs on airboats around here and uh, obviously this isn't something you're gonna see up in Gross Point. Uh, anyway, everything nice and proper under the hood. A pretty cool engine that's made into a Turbo Hydra 400 transmission, uh, a real bulletproof three-speed that uh, got used in uh, a lot of different applications like Rolls-Royce and Jaguar over the years and uh, is one of the, you know, famous global automatic transmissions. If you want a good, solid, proper shifting automatic, GM was the way to go, at least in this era. So uh, everything nice and lovely under there. You see all the original stickers and uh, the original uh, emission sticker on the car. Uh, I just love seeing the preservation in this thing. Absolutely love it.
I must get that back down. Damn, that's a oof, heavy sucker. And, there, and look at this cat coming up here. What the hell is he doing? Go get a bird. I'm sure there's plenty around here. There, and look at the size of that thing. <sighs> Peter's feeding these. Uh, anyway, getting, go on, Rouse. It's a terrifying amount of animals here. I'm just waiting for him to come up with giraffes or rhinos. Uh, all right, the interior of this car, and here is where I get into the one glaring issue that drives me insane. Uh, Peter and I have this eternal argument about when to. Uh, finish a car and market it. And when I bought this car, uh, it was essentially perfect, uh, with the exception of the steering wheel, which, let me see if I can get under there, which has some cracks in it, which was a, uh, you know, a manufacturing failing at the time of these cars. They, uh, you know, every one you're going to find, no matter how nice it is, is probably going to have cracks in the wheel. So I bought this cover for it. Actually, I bought a different one, which snapped instantly. So I went out yesterday and bought this one. And I wanted to have this wheel restored. I found a great little shop that'll do it for, I don't know, like 500 bucks. They recast it, they redo it, it's perfect. But it's a four to six week lead time. And I just, I was struggling over, okay, do I pull the wheel, send it off, get it done, and let the car sit for another few weeks and then market it? My gut instinct was yes. But here's the deal is, you know, Peter is this guy who's, you know, lighting his cigars off $100 bills and belly laughing like those fat cats and top hats in the back of town cars that have the, uh, uh, the drivers exposed in the weather up front, you know, with that. <laughs> as they trade pork bellies and, you know, make a fortune. So, and, you know, here I am living very modestly, making soup out of ketchup and water and whatever I'm doing. So, uh, Peter said, market it, market it, get it done, get it up, get it out, get it out, get it rolling. And I'm laboring over it, and I just defer to him. I said, the hell with it. All right, I'm going to do it. Even though it goes against my instincts, I'm going to do it. It's not ready, but I'm going to do it, and here it is. So uh, here's the one glaring flaw in the car that drives me crazy, is having this stupid uh, advanced auto parts, uh, you know, steering wheel cover on it, uh, because the original wheel underneath, if I can find it here, has some cracks in it. Oh, there's one. You can see what happens to these things. But anyway, there's some shops out there that recast and make them nice. And if I owned this car, I would certainly do that. Uh, you know, and, and no, I'm not going to do it now. There's no point to it. I'm not going to have the car sit for four to six weeks. So it's for sale. And, uh, you know, if you want to have it done, I'll tell you where to get it done. Anyway, you can see that the interior quality, and this was debatable at the time because this... How do I put it? These were not the finest materials. I mean, they're nice, they're not bad, but you've got this contact paper sort of wood. Uh, you've got this molded door panel, big thick pole with, uh, I love this color, by the way. It's the color of my parents' appliances in the 70s. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Uh, but anyway, and this was a complaint by some people at the time or companies that, you know, the Cadillac quality wasn't really what it's supposed to be. Now, you know, if you paid more money on top of the sticker price, uh, the leather was optional, and it's fantastic leather, uh, but you could make this thing look like a Belgian bordello inside if you're willing to spend another thousand bucks or so. Uh, deep pal carpeting, uh, rich, thick piranha skin velour, and, uh, you know, whatever else you, you wanted to have in it you could get. So, um, you know, but in the baser models, and even the Calais, which was a yet cheaper still, uh, you know, a Cadillac didn't have that much more in terms of uh, material build quality than your average high-end Chevrolet at the time. And uh, that is part of what made them affordable, part of what made them prolific, and uh, part of what sealed their problems that would come on later on. Uh, you know, when a car is synonymous with wealth, with success, with exclusivity, and all of a sudden there's one on every street corner because, you know, your average guy can afford it with some creative financing, uh, no wonder Mercedes got a bump and people started going there. There is just no way that, you know, Mr. Howell and Mr. Rockefeller want to pull up to the golf club and uh, see middle class guys driving the car they are. It's just not going to happen. And when you've got 200,000 Cadillac Coupe de Vils and sedans being produced in that year, you're going to see quite a few of them. And 
And uh, even though they rode that for a long time and it made them an awful lot of money, uh, it eventually became a problem for Cadillac. Uh, anyway, the condition of this particular one is epic, and why I say it's something you would have found on a used Cadillac lot in 1976, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the way it's been preserved by this guy who had it for so many years is just fantastic. Uh, in the rear seats, huge. Look at the width of this car. Uh, I mean, you could fit three Canadians back there with very chipper attitudes, no issues at all. Nice big giant center armrest. Uh, beautiful soft leather that you slide around on. More of that uh, contact paper wood trim. Uh, because they went to a fixed rear window, they now could have pull handles, so uh, the guy in the back seat could grab that oh shit handle and get out of the car easily. Uh, also, uh, overhead uh, shoulder belt, uh, seat belt things, and a place to hang your dry cleaning. And uh, even the uh, headliner, you know, nothing special. Same as you'd find in a Chevrolet, but nice to see it original and perfect. And uh, again, this is just the kind of stuff, the preservation of this car, uh, that is so hard to find. Uh, you know, you see stuff that's been buttered up or, you know, put back together, but nothing uh, original like this. It's very, very tough to find in that condition uh, with the chrome and everything nice and tight. Very interesting, very cool, and uh, very happy to have this car. So let me find the keys and we're going to hop in. Nice solid way the door closes, and it actually did close all the way, so let's fire up this 472. Again, with the dual key system that I love. This car is gone. Listen to that thing. Be quiet. This car's gone. There's nothing like it anymore. That's it. This is the, I mean, you know, they made cars that were similar up until the early 90s. Then they came out with that Aero Cadillac, which, you know, was still a full frame, still a body on frame, but uh, it still wasn't like this. I, I think that probably in 1976, when this giant C platform went away and it became the smaller platform afterwards, uh, I mean, this thing was the... You know, this is going back to the 50s, using that same formula of a giant ladder frame, a uh, huge V8 engine, smooth shifting transmission, a uh, solid rear axle with, you know, this one's a live axle, mind you, with the you know, trailing arms and such. But still, uh, this was a formula for what an American car should be. And uh, when every American car started becoming European, this went away. And uh, it's a shame because we really gave up something that was so uniquely American. Uh, over here, you've got your headlights, you've got your climate control, uh, which works fantastically well, by the way. AC works. You've got your wiper control here. Uh, look at all the chrome on the vents. It's still perfect. Uh, you've got this swooping information center uh, going all the way over to the uh, passenger side. All these warning lights here that tell you everything you might need to know, uh, but not until you need to know it. The only thing you need to know for driving around here is your speed, and you got that in a nice little muted horizontal uh, speedometer there, and uh, of course your fuel gauge. Uh, over here you've got your power antenna, which actually works in this car. For a new Mitsubishi with yeah, just new Mitsubishi. Down. You heard right. Oh god, I can't listen to that crap. Uh, that's the original power antenna working fine. Very, very nice stuff. Let me put that back down again. Uh, AM, FM, uh, stereo, 8-track. Uh, more of the sort of fake wood trim swooping the length of the car with neat little, you know, inlays with designs on them. Uh, you see the original Cadillac uh, script up there on the top of the dashboard with the silver still nice and intact. You've got little map lights under here you can turn on. Uh, nice big glove box. Uh, this car in 74 was the first car to offer airbags. <clears throat> That's fascinating. Uh, driver and passenger, you could order that as a pretty expensive option, and nobody did because it was expensive and people thought it was stupid. So uh, after a year, that went away, and they didn't offer it again for another dozen years or so. But there you go. This car had optional airbags in 1974. Uh, there you see all original stickers. Look at the condition of all the warranty and uh, owner documents here. This car was sold in November of 73 to Ivan Austin, Maplewood Drive. I'm probably giving out too much information, but uh, you know, to find a set of books and I mean, what an absolute time machine this car is. 
What's this now? Before the key can be removed. Your new Catamax steering. <laughs> love it. I love finding all this. And here is one of the best parts that I found in this car. Other than the bag of eight tracks down there. Was this original 1974 Catamac eight track. So one handed. Let's get that out. Let's pop it in. See what we got. So there you go. This is what your Cadillac buyer in 74 was messed into. Uh, I happen to know one here. We've got, uh, what do we have? Anita Kerr Singers, Chet Atkins, Arthur Fiedler, Boston Pops, yeah, of course. Uh, John Denver, you gotta love it. Uh, no Electric Light Orchestra, Joe Williams, Eddie Arnold. Anyway, this is what people in the 1970s were listening to. So uh, you went out to uh, the movies, watched, uh, I don't know what you watched, Dirty Harry or something, or Death Wish, and then you came home and uh, while you were driving, you listened to this, and it was all very nice stuff. I'm gonna keep that in. Uh, I also found this great bag of eight tracks with it. So I don't know, the guy must have died or probably would have kept his beloved eight tracks. I don't know why he tied them up in an impossible to get two way. Let's see what we got in here. All right, we've got Al Hurt. Putting the hurt on. We got John, that's when I brought the Johnny Cash thing. I kept that from an old Pontiac. We got Charlie Pride, Kiss an Angel. Sounds lewd. The legendary Jim Reeves. I think this is part of an 8-track box set. There's another Jim Reeves in there. Yeah, there it is. That was a shame. He got hurt on that horse and didn't work out for him. Uh, Hank Williams. All right, so there we go. We've got uh, all the stuff we might want 8-track uh, wise. Uh, passenger side, you've got your power windows. You've got a great little ashtray there. Uh, no power locks in this car. Fascinating. Uh, no passenger mirror. So, uh, again, a bit of a stripper, this car. Uh, but uh, that's fine with me. And at this stage, it doesn't really matter much. Uh, the way the windows work, fast and smooth. You know, the preservation of this car is just absolutely epic. Got an ashtray. Of course, people smoked in the 70s. You gotta have a nice big ashtray. And uh, of course, the seat belt. So let's get that on and go for a drive. All right, so here we go. 4,900 pounds of full frame, 472 cubic inch Cadillac. And look at the cat, there it is. Who knows what it was doing over there? I was hoping the window was down so it can leap in and attach itself to my face. <laughs> Waiting for these gates. Got a lot of flack for that, Peter. You should really upgrade your gates. All right, and away we go. So you've got this incredible expansive hood uh, with the uh, chrome strip down the middle. Uh, you could get a hood ornament on some of these things, but not this one. <clears throat> that was part of the uh, Delegance package, I believe. Uh, Dalton did a fair job on the front windshield today. Uh, a shit job on the rear, I can tell you. On the way in, I could barely see out of it. Uh, maybe he's hoping I wouldn't notice. And uh, here it is. So the thing just glides down the road. When I got in this car and drove it home, I was blown away. I mean, I'd been driving that, you know, the Cougar, the Thunderbird, you know, I had some of these sort of big uh, full-frame cars. The last C-body car I had was that um, uh, 76 uh, Oldsmobile uh, Regency 98 Coupe. But even that didn't feel as heavy and as smooth and as ponderous as this Cadillac does. I mean, this thing feels like you're navigating the Queen Mary and it feels like you're sitting in the grand ballroom of the Queen Mary. I've got like a foot and a half or more of space on my left. I can't even reach the stuff over there on the right. The width of this car is so epic. A 230 inch length, 130 inch wheelbase, same as that 59 uh, Coupe de Ville, which seems so enormous. Uh, this is a big sucker. And they kept building it right in the middle of that OPEC gas crunch. Didn't care. It was selling like crazy. People went nuts for it. Uh, they still sold a ton of them. So why stop? <laughs> And they didn't. You know, they came out with that Nova-based 
uh, Seville in 76. And that was sort of a tip of the hat to Mercedes-Benz saying, okay, we see you. You're starting to sell some cars. Uh, we're going to start building something a little bit smaller and sportier to compete. Uh, but at the end of the day, that guy has brakes. He's going to have to use them. Um, at the end of the day, it's just a giant friggin' car, and it's like navigating a giant boat down the road uh, that you just sort of aim towards a point in the distance and make little corrections as you go. Uh, it actually accelerated pretty good. Uh, zero to 60 was about 10, eh, almost 11 seconds, uh, which is shit today, but wasn't bad at the time. Uh, also, the braking was pretty good, like 153 feet from 60, uh, big discs up front, drums in the back, over assisted, uh, a skid pad, eh, not so much. Understeer would rip the front tires off the car if you tried it long enough. I mean, it was not a nimble car and uh, still isn't today. But if you want something to just cruise and enjoy yourself with and have a good time with, Man, what a lovely, lovely car to drive around in. I mean, over-assisted steering. And uh, again, this was one of the complaints at the time. All the hipsters are looking for, you know, cars that are active and driving, that, that you know, yeah, little bucket seats and nimble handling like the Mercedes was at the time with their six cylinders and their steering and all that. Cadillac said, screw it, <laughs> screw it. This car is going to completely segregate you from the road and uh, you're gonna just live in a cocoon where you're not bothered by all the commotion going on outside and I think that was the biggest selling feature of this car uh, people just felt tremendously uh, detached from everything else, you know, kind of the way Lexus is today and when it came out, uh, much cushier than other, the European cars it competed with. It was just, you know, quiet and there for people who weren't uh, into the whole driving thing. And uh, this was Cadillac at the time. Uh, I also think Cadillac went through then what Mercedes is going through now, you know, where their cars are becoming less exclusive, less for the rich, more for everybody. And is that eventually going to hurt the Mercedes brand? Well, you know, I think it already has, and I think it's going to continue to do so. Uh, you know, Cadillac was a victim of its own success, and uh, Mercedes is going to find that they're doing the same thing, I think. So uh, anyway, there it is. Uh, 1974 Cadillac Coupe de Ville, 51,000 miles on this thing, all original inside and out. Uh, genuinely one of the most incredible vintage cars that I've had in my possession in the last 10 years. It feels more like a time machine than just about anything else I've had and it's an absolute joy to drive, to look at. Uh, the attention it gets on the street is just really cool. A lot of thumbs up from people and especially young people. They really seem to like this car. Uh, don't know why young people find it accessible, but they do. Uh, much more so than a lot of vintage cars I've driven around. They just find this thing to be cool. And uh, maybe you will too. Uh, so there it is. Uh, if you're interested in the car, it's going to be for sale at Auto House of Naples. 239-263-8500. On the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, thanks so much for having a look. Appreciate it. We've got some more interesting stuff coming up. Uh, sorry I didn't get a video up last uh, week like promised or at the end of the week. I told you I'd get something Thursday or Friday and I didn't. And uh, that's just because one Dalton fucked up a car and made it so that I couldn't market it. And uh, otherwise it's just tough to get stuff ready these days. And uh, partially that's why I'm driving this thing with this dumb steering wheel cover instead of waiting four weeks for the... Uh, for the wheel to get recast. So uh, thanks for having a look. We'll come up with something cool. I promise another video this week. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And uh, we'll keep going from there. Take care and we'll see you with the next one.